Welcome back. Today I am in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, teaching yoga. So a viewer asked me to talk about the Kutasta, the spiritual eye, and specifically about a talk that Yogananda gave when he was uh, a young man. And this was recorded by his brother, Sananda Lal Ghosh, who wrote a book called Mejda. So it's a great book. Uh, I'll have a link below. Make sure you check it out. And it has a bunch of Yogananda's very, very early lectures. These were lectures that he gave his friends as he was teaching them meditation. And he talked about the Kutasa and how there are two forces that guard entrance to the spiritual eye. Now, I always thought that was very, very interesting because if you look at a lot of temples, you'll find two symbolic protectors to the entrance of the temple. And so you can see that in Greece, you can see that in Japan, you can see that in China. It's a very, very common thing. You also see it in churches with the gargoyles, two forces protecting the entrance. <laughs> Yogananda says, when the yogi converges the gaze of the two eyes at the kutasta, the point between the eyebrows, and concentrates deeply, a light will appear. In the center, a dark spot or area will form, which is known as Brahmari Guha, which literally translates as a cave, Guha, that is filled with honey, Brahmari, relating to or belonging to a bee. Hence, the receptacle of Amrita, the divine nectar of immortality. Brahmari is also a name of Durga, an aspect of the Lord as the Divine Mother. It also means revolving, referring in this context to the spiritual eye whose light appears to revolve as it deepens into a luminous tunnel of gold and blue, in whose center is a white star that leads to cosmic consciousness. So here we have a whole lot of information. First of all, we have the spiritual light that shows up. Second of all, we have this light deepens and as it deepens, the experience deepens. And so here they're describing it as revolving and that very much can happen. In fact, uh, that's what happened to me very early on. It was very disturbing. I had an experience of the spiritual eye revolving on me and it actually felt like the entire earth was revolving. And it was, I didn't know what to think of it. And I talked to everybody, nobody could answer me. I was in the ashram, I talked to the monks, they told me I was dreaming. It's very, very frustrating. Which, uh, so now I'm here talking to you, <laughs> giving answers when nobody could give me answers. That is a very big possibility of what can happen. But a, a more common experience is that the light will begin to wave. So you'll see the light and then around that, the light will begin to kind of wave. The, it, it may appear as white, the gold may appear, but it will keep waving over you and it's, it's quite fast, it's not, it's not slow. You know, it's, it, it's quite fast as it gets going, as your perception of it deepens. So Yogananda goes on, it is surrounded by luminous rays, a manifestation of the creative vibration of Om, and protected by two powerful forces, Avarana, a veil-like power, and Vikshepa, a scattering power. So now here we have the two forces a veil-like power, and a scattering power. As the devotee tries to concentrate on this manifestation, it vanishes. Vikshepa deflects his gaze and scatters his attention, and Avarana casts a veil of delusion over his perception. Practice of self-control, adherence to a pure diet, detachment from worldly objects, endurance with even-mindedness, 
And Kriya Yoga Pranayama increases the power of sattva, the spiritual or elevating quality in the yogi. This creates a great power at the kutasta, which enables the yogi to penetrate the darkness of closed eyes. Then, as he looks at the Brahmarigua, the cave of the spiritual eye, that is, the powers of Avarana and Vikshepa decrease and the mouth of the cave opens wide, revealing the inside. The golden luster increases a thousandfold. The dark area becomes the brilliant blue of Kutasta Chaitanya, the universal consciousness, the Christ or Krishna consciousness, and in its center the bright starlight of cosmic consciousness. This triune light is the spiritual eye through which spirit is perceived and through which the consciousness passes to reunite with God. With the annihilation of Avarana and Vikshepa, Dharma Tattva, the true nature of the divine principle that upholds all creation is revealed. And now he talks about surrender. Without surrender to God, through the knowledge that he alone is the doer, it is not possible to reach him. When the sense-bound soul merges with God, the organs of the elevated senses are automatically constrained and rendered powerless. When Kriya Yoga is performed correctly, bliss is felt within. Great fulfillment and satisfaction come to the devotee. But if Kriya is performed incorrectly, no satisfaction accrues and the devotee may develop an aversion or disgust. But such irritation and discouragement should not be allowed to take hold. For they are the devotee's enemies and great obstacles in his path to self-realization. If the devotee perseveres in spite of any difficulty, he will find soul satisfaction. Isn't that just amazing? I, I think that's possibly one of the most important things he ever put in writing. And there's just a ton of information there to, to pull apart. So. But I, I know uh, the gentleman who asked me this question, his first thing that he wants to understand is this Avarana and Vikshepa. So Avarana is the veil-like power that comes over and brings darkness over the spiritual eye. Vikshepa is the scattering power. Vikshepa is, is really a product of your left brain. If you think about it, that's how the left brain works. It kind of skips all around everywhere. It doesn't take in everything at once. It's kind of like ADHD. The uh, NLP way to deal with ADHD is to teach trance. Because if you're not in a trance, you're not able to focus. It's a very strange thing. You think, you know, we have to be in this very, very focused frame of mind. Like if you're going to learn something at school, you have to be in a very focused frame of mind. But Actually, it, it's, it's a product of both concentration and trance. And so it's, it's not just this. It's, it, the, the way that I try to explain this when I wrote my book, uh, Hacking the Universe, when I was trying to explain these two forces of concentration, you know, you have this and then you have this. So it's these two forces of concentration. And it requires both of them and it kind of makes sense in the context of love. You know, if you are with somebody that you love, you give them your full, full-on attention. You know, you're there with them. You're not floating around over here and you're not floating around over there. You give them your full-on attention. Isn't that beautiful? So I once took a class on listening the guy said that there were three levels of listening, and this applies directly to meditation, if you think about it. So the first level is you're not even really there at all. So the guy is talking to you, and you're talking to the other guy, and you're just talking. And if you watch some people, when they talk together, they don't actually hear anything that the other person says at all. It just blows right at everything. They can't hear anything the other person is saying. They're just, it's like darts on a dartboard and barely anything hits anybody else's dartboard. 
So that's the first level of listening. And the second level of listening is I will say something and you will listen and you'll pause, you'll wait to speak. While you're listening to me, you're thinking about your response because you've got this information and, and, and you've got to get it out at me, right? So I'm talking and you're listening, but while you're listening, you're going, oh, but I, I'm going to tell you this. And so I finish and you go, oh, da, 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 that reminds me of this and this and this. And while you're talking at that same moment, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, wait, we need pauses. I'm going to jump in because I got to tell him about this and this and this. And so we've got this jumping back and forth and we're always ready to cut each other off because we've got this important information we've got to share back at the other person. And so now I don't it's beyond the dartboards at least but but we're we're still not really taking in what the person has to say and so we said there's, there's this third level of communication of listening where you just take in what the other person really is saying and you just shut up you shut up your mouth you shut up your brain and you just absorb everything that they have to say and he said that people communicate like a train and it's one car then it's another car then it's another car coming down the train line and he says if you never listen enough to hear the caboose of what they're saying the last car on the train track if you don't listen that far you'll never actually understand what the other person is saying you'll never hear it and they will more importantly the other person will never feel like you've actually heard them. And so sometimes somebody will name a car and they'll, they'll be talking and they'll have one car, then they'll have another thought, then they'll have another car and another thought, and then there'll be a pause. And your instinct will be, I have to fill that pause. I have to jump in and talk. But if you actually wait, another thought may come, another car may come down that line and that last car might be the caboose of what they're thinking. And once you take all of that in and really absorb it, and then begin to formulate your thoughts on what you'd like to say back, only after they've finished their whole train, now you begin to formulate a response. And then you give the response from this wholly different area than just this back and forth, back and forth, right? It's just a totally different uh, style of listening and communication. It's very, very deep, much more profound. And uh, I invite you to try it out with your family, with your friends. It's really cool stuff. And so our communication in meditation with, with the deeper self, with the brain, with the deep brain, is very similar in that we, we need to be very, very present and really listen. And so it's not just this hard focus. It's a soft focus. It's just a purely there focus. So it's not just this and it's not just letting go, you know. It's not just letting go. It's not just focusing. It's this magic combination of these two forces of the mind and when you bring them together you begin to open that spiritual eye now if you don't see the spiritual eye, don't freak out oh my god i don't see the spiritual eye i'm never gonna get to this point that you're no don't don't diminish yourself that way if you don't see it there's also a feeling you can feel that cave you know everybody has a predominant sense that they really key into it. it might be it might be sight it might be hearing it might be feeling so when you're in meditation and you don't see the spiritual eye don't freak out but try and feel it and in fact there's this whole trick i have this video on my channel where i talk about this beautiful exercise from todd murphy look at your nose but put your mind at the spiritual eye so you you're beginning to separate your physical sight and your mental seeing activity. So they're two separate things and we usually have them joined as one. And if you just stare at the spiritual eye long enough, 
you might separate those automatically, but you might not. I've met people who have meditated for years and years and they still have trouble seeing the spiritual eye, which is very, very normal. It happens a lot. So don't feel left out, okay? So watch that video about separating the two. You've got the physical vision and the activity of seeing which is something from the right brain, the right hippocampus, that seeing internally and that physical looking, they're two separate things, you understand, and you're trying to separate those. And so that's why I talk, one of the reasons why I talk so much about dilating your focus in the spiritual eyes, because that's another way to separate those two. So. Todd Murphy's exercise, he says, look at your nose, but mentally perceive here. Look with your brain here. Look with your eyes at the tip of your nose and you separate the two. I like to just dilate my eyes, but they both kind of work. And so I invite you to try out that little exercise. Vikshepa, getting past this scattering, that is all of what Kriya Yoga is designed to do. So specifically the Om Japa in each chakra is cleaning the chakra, cleaning the projection. So we have a limbic brain, it's projecting into the body. We call those chakras. Nobody talks about it like this, just me and Todd Murphy. That's what we're actually accomplishing. We are blowing up those perceptions so that they reverse back to the brain and you'll just find yourself in front of the spiritual eye. You'll kind of roll up into the brain, see yourself in front of the spiritual eye. That is overcoming vikshepa because it's those projections of the limbic brain, which we call chakras, which have us projected out into the world, right? So we're active and we're outward and we're projected and we're bringing that all back up into pratyahara we're rolling it back up so that we can perceive the truth and the truth is your brain your own brain and everything that's in it so i know there's mind and there's brain and there's you know intellect and all that stuff it's all in your brain though okay it's just all there that's the place, all right? So we'll just talk about the place. So forgive me if I don't dissect everything down to what exactly I'm. It's all in the brain. So Pratyahara brings us back into the brain, into the truth, which is the spiritual eye. That's a perception of truth, the spiritual eye. And so we've overcome Vikshepa. We've overcome the scattering of the chakras of the limbic brain. The limbic brain is scattered into the, into the four corners of the earth, right? We're doing this and we're going there and blah, blah, blah. And we're all in the story mode, right? As Wake told me, the, the perpetual story machine, right? We're stuck in that perpetual story machine. And by the process of Kriya, by the process of Om Japa, we are reversing that so that we can perceive the spiritual eye and just be there, right? But we don't want to be there like this because then your mind will be pinched. You'll actually block yourself if you're just... If you, if you try and focus this kind of way, just like... You will block yourself because now you're in... You're, so you're in the truth, right? You canceled the projections. This is totally possible. <laughs> you can cancel the projections and still be in front of the spiritual eye and still be in the predator mode of the left brain. Because the left brain is like, I'm going to do this. And that's predator mode. You, and you, you have to let that go. So you have to, this is why the story of love is so helpful because you have to just let go and just be. Just be with your spiritual eye. And so you see, it's, it's, it, you, there is concentration, but there's also this letting go. So you've canceled out Vikshepa, you've canceled out the scattering power. 
but you have to get past that bail. And that's this letting go. And so what's the very next thing that Yogananda talks about in his little talk here? Surrender, letting go. You have to open yourself up. You have to relax enough that you get out of that predator mode and into this kind of welcoming, accepting, opening, surrendering love. And it's, and I don't mean like a fake love, like I love you, I love you, I love you. I don't mean like that. I mean just real deep gratitude, surrender, appreciation, opening yourself. Hakala. I talk about Hakala a lot and it's really, it's really a uh, metaphor. It's, 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 a, it's a technique, but it's, it's a really a metaphor for exactly this kind of concentration that I'm talking about because Hakala, you pick one point and then you expand your vision. So you hold the one point, but while you're holding that one point, you become aware of your peripheral vision as well. And when you do that, try it out. Go into your peripheral vision and notice how your brain shuts off. For, for just a second, you know, it shuts off. So you're stepping into a new world. You are inducing the right hippocampus and it's huge. First, we have to get there. We have to come back to what is the truth, which is the brain. That's overcoming Vikshepa. The veil, we can't be in predator mode because the brain will, will be in the left brain and it's, it's too tense, it's too strong. It has to be kind of a soft focus, right? You can't make God show up. There's, every mystic talks about this, about there's, and at the very end, there's grace. Every mystic talks about this, and, and that's what it is. It's overcoming that second veil, and you can't do it by force. You have to really open up. And that opening up is inducing the right hippocampus. That's it. That's the secret right there. So I hope you love this. I hope it, it really helps you out in meditation. If it does, hit that bell so I can see you guys next time.